Cool. All right, so once again, I'm Reed D'Amico, and the title of my talk is Science, Advocacy, and Life with CF Coming Out with Cystic Fibrosis. So in order to get a better picture of what my life was like with cystic fibrosis, we have to go back to year one through 11, where I didn't even know what cystic fibrosis was. So I was a pretty normal kid. I played t-ball, I played baseball, I played basketball, I played soccer, I played football. I was just that standard 11-year-old boy, did really the normal things that most people would do. My friends usually centered around sporting events, and my weekends were usually involved playing soccer games and just playing video games and being outside with a bunch of friends. I was originally from the D.C. area, but I grew up in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, which is between Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, South Carolina. So most of my life was spent outside. I would be out on the ocean, I would be at the beach, I'd spend time outside. So I spent a lot of my life living this vacation lifestyle, going out on boats. So even though I was engaging in sports, like living in a resort island was a little different. But at the same time, I did have my family there as well. So for those first 11 years, everything was pretty average. I can't think of anything that really made me stand out as a different person. However, given that this is a CF conference, it is important to dive into what it's like to be someone with CF. So my story goes something like this. My dad had something called polyps, which were in his nose, and I remember going to an ENT appointment with my dad one day. And he was there consulting whether or not he wanted to have them removed, but at the time, I had a sinus infection, so being a good physician, he also looked at my nose as well and said, yikes. You're an 11 year old who also has sinus polyps and it's kind of a mess in there. And I thought nothing of it. And the doctor said to my dad and I, hey, we should probably get this blood test for this thing, but he probably doesn't have it. He seems like a healthy kid. There's nothing wrong here. And he orders this blood test. I go and get my blood drawn and think nothing of it. Three months later, I asked my mom like, hey mom, like what was the result of this blood test? And she kind of shrugs off me like, oh, it came back positive. You have something called cystic fibrosis. We're going to go to a doctor later. And I thought nothing of it. I mean, I felt normal. As I said, my first 11 years of life, I wasn't in the hospital. I didn't have failure to thrive. Sure, looking back now, there were some foods that I did avoid because they'd give me an upset stomach. I did tend to cough more than my friends. I was always a nasally kid, but I thought nothing of it. And then so after I asked my mom, maybe a few weeks later, uh, we went to Charleston, South Carolina, to the Medical University of South Carolina, which is where I had my first CF clinic. So during this clinic visit, I really only remember some of the negative takeaways. So as a reminder, I'm 11 years old at this point. A lot of people with CF are diagnosed when they're younger, or some people with CF are diagnosed in the 30s and 40s. There's a wide range in terms of when people with CF are diagnosed, but I was 11, so I'm able to grasp what life expectancies should look like, what you should expect for your childhood years. And I remember one of the first things the doctor said to us was sporting events might change. You know, playing football might be difficult, playing soccer, because there's a lot of bacteria and you could get sick. You know, people with CF have bacteria within their lungs and you don't really want to be around these gross locker room environments so you probably shouldn't play sports or you need to be extra careful and you're saying this to an 11 year old at the time whose life really does revolve around sports then family vacations should change I remember growing up, like I used to go out to Colorado, I remember going out of the country a few times and the doctor was saying hey this probably isn't now the best idea because you don't want to be so far from CF care and you're not going to have all these different regimens, they don't really want to be out of the country. So I remember that being taken away from me. Friendships as well, in the sense that if your friends are sick, Reed, you probably shouldn't hang out with them. You don't want to get sick as well. You don't want to make yourself susceptible to whatever cold that they have. So as an 11-year-old, I'm being told that I'm now going to have limitations with regard to who I'm going to hang out with. Also, if my friends are doing something that's particularly gross, involving mud or just being outside and whatnot, I now cannot take part. The conversation then starts to go past what I can interpret up until this point of age. So we talk about things like graduation. 
and how when I was diagnosed, people with CF sometimes didn't even make it out of high school. Either they became too sick or, and died, or sometimes they were too ill to even achieve the degree. And I remember that being taken away from me. And then college also came up, but college was this fleeting thought of like, well, if you make it out of high school, college is incredibly difficult for people with CF. So you probably shouldn't even really consider that. And even though I'm from South Carolina at the age of 11, I didn't think that marriage was anytime soon. So I remember partnership and marriage being something that I remember the doctor very specifically saying this probably doesn't happen to most people with CF don't get married. And sure, this is something that's nowhere on my radar as an 11 year old, but I remember that being taken away. And then lastly, we talk about life expectancy. How long people with CF live, what it's like to hit old age, and how people with CF usually don't. So as an 11 year old, I had lost a great foundation in what I thought everyone would expect. And that was all because of a blood test that I put no thought into because of a stuffy nose that had turned into a terminal illness where so many things had been taken away from me. So in this process, the severe compartmentalization process began. The first one is, this doesn't make sense, you know? Sure, looking back, I did have reasons to think that I did have CF, but there was no way I could wrap my head around this. I was a normal kid. How could I go from one day feeling fine to having all these things taken away? If we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. When you're an 11 year old, you do have a sense of autonomy and control. And I remember talking to my family saying, hey, outside of CF appointments or CF discussions, I'd never want to talk about it. I only want to leave CF present when necessary, and I want to keep it out of all conversation. Friends can't know. So when you're 11, you come up easily embarrassed. And how can you as an 11 year old articulate to your friends that out of nowhere, you now have this really scary thing that you can't even fully explain. So I compartmentalize all of these different parts of CF to the point where I thought that even if friends figured out or someone's kind of suspected like, oh, Reed, why, why are you always kind of gunky sounding to say, I just have a cold. Oh, my mom was sick and I got it. My dad was sick and I got it. My brother came home with a cold and I caught it too. Always having an excuse for what was going on. But lastly, the I'm not dying. You know, how, as an 11 year old, do you interpret this concept of death? Especially when you're told that within the next two decades or so, that it gets a little iffy in terms of life expectancy. How do you wrap your head around this besides just putting it deep back into your head? This isn't real life. It's easy to manipulate conversation the way you want it to be. You can either look at things through rose colored glasses. You can look at things as much worse than they are. And for me, I just didn't want to think about it. You know, I wanted to take this evil concept of CF that had thrown on me, this incredible burden and put it into the back of my mind as something that, yeah, it happened, but I never want to think about it again. But with CF does come this hourglass. And we talk about late diagnosis a lot in CF um, now, but there is a different concept between those who are possibly diagnosed between the ages of maybe seven into their teenage years versus those who are diagnosed into their 20s, 30s, and even 40s. When you're in those formative years, how do you actually grasp what it's like to be given a disease like CF? And for me personally, this led to depression. Because I had compartmentalized so many of these things with CF out of my life, I isolated myself from a network. I didn't want to talk about it, and I put up this front that I couldn't talk about my CF, which made me depressed, which eventually led to anger. I remember when I was a kid, I stopped playing sports, but my dad was a football coach. And my brother would get, my brother who is 19 months younger than I am, got extra time with my dad and had extra family involvements and would be able to do things with friends that I wouldn't be able to. And this led to some incredible anger. But in my head, I also thought, well, if you're given this awful life expectancy, why not just give up? You know, if you're so depressed and you're so angry, why try it all? Which eventually led to guilt. 
And there is a reason I put this one in the center because this is one that frankly I think a lot of people with CF struggle with and I struggle with today. And I very much remember growing up, like shortly after my diagnosis, I walked to my parents' bedroom and I saw my mom sitting in her closet with a baby book of me sobbing. And I didn't know how to handle that, so I walked away and I didn't tell her until about two years ago that I saw. Because I knew that so much was changing in my life. I saw how my parents were struggling but wouldn't vocalize their weakness or concern for me. I saw how I was being self-destructive and hiding all of these things and I didn't know what to do. This was a time before there was Facebook and there really were communities. My closest CF clinic was a two and a half hour drive away, so I really was isolated from the CF community. I didn't know what it meant to have CF. I didn't have these examples of people who were thriving with CF and I kind of just built my own world that sheltered myself from it. And while there is this concept of giving up, one thing that I want to talk about in this presentation is that I developed a coping mechanism that I'll call or do it all, which I don't want to glorify as look what I have done because a lot of the things I'm about to talk about in this presentation in high school, these achievements come from a severe place of pain and hiding things. So in high school, I developed the mentality if I'm beating the odds, I don't have CF. So once again, if we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Friends can't know, and I'm not dying, are the things that are present in my head while in high school. So I wanted to overachieve. I started getting involved in student council. I was president of my freshman class, president of my sophomore class, vice president of the student body my junior year, president of the uh, student body my senior year. I did something called History Day. So. I actually don't really care about American history, but with this idea in my head that I had to be so good at everything, I ended up winning the state of South Carolina and competing at the national level for a History Day project that involved the Interstate Highway Act and the destruction of economies in South Carolina. But looking back, I didn't care. And it was just this idea of like, how could someone with CF do this, you know? You're told all of these different things and expectations of what CF is like, that if I overachieve and do these things, I don't have CF. Same thing applies to writing competitions. Um, so I have my PhD in engineering. Um, I'm not the biggest like creative writer. I'm hoping to get a bit more into it, but I remember in high school publishing poetry and short stories just to do it. Because once again, it was an example of how to cover up the fact that I had CF. President of X, once again, president of Rotary, president of Interact, started Rocketry Club, Math Club, all of these different things that I once again was using to separate myself from CF. So even today, when I go to therapy, as a lot of people with CF do, I struggle with how to separate myself from my resume or my CV. Because my resume became a way to separate my true identity from who I really was. If I can live off of a piece of paper, no one could ever know that I had CF. So this motivation, once again, led to perfect scores. It led to a number of all AP classes. I even uh, was a tennis state champion because tennis is a pretty clean sport. Um, an example of just doing all of these different things, you know? I couldn't have CF, no one could know I had CF. I had isolated myself intentionally from so many people in my community that there's no way I could if I'm doing all these different things. So, but growing up, I really always had a penchant for math and science, and I was that kid who actually did competitive science fairs in high school, which was a lot of fun. And this all started with an idea in eighth grade. And I really, to this day, think that my interest in research started because I have CF. When I had CF, I placed it so far into the back of my mind, but still would ruminate on it, still knew that there was an issue with it, still knew that there were so many problems, but how can I fix it? How can I deliver a solution? How can I think through it effectively to make myself better? Which essentially, you can translate into research as well. So I remember in eighth grade, I took an idea, so in South Carolina, marsh grass was dying off at a high rate, and people didn't know why. So I thought to myself, okay, well, let me try to figure it out. And I ended up figuring out that it had something to do with the new docking codes and won eighth, uh, the state science fair in eighth grade. 
This continued on into high school, where I actually ended up representing the United States at the International Science and Engineering Fair. Um, it's that same fair where you see kids who like develop pancreatic cancer blood tests. It's like that same fair. And I remember I went to it my freshman year, and I actually won fourth place overall at 15 or 16 years old. And after that, I worked with lawmakers, actually changed docking codes, do all these different things. And that was kind of my first taste of what it's like to actually take an issue, take a problem, think through it, research it, carry it out an experiment, and then carry out activism by talking to lawmakers, and actually carrying out a solution. And this nonsense continued with a lot of different awards. Um, I remember giving talks at Georgia Tech in high school, giving talks at Yale, getting handwritten letters, letters from MIT, which ultimately boosted my ego. But keep in mind, I don't share these things to say, look how great I am. You have to remember that I did a lot of these things just because I was so embarrassed and so unwilling to accept my CF identity that I hid myself behind this resume. And I built up my ego through this external um, concept of awards. So I actually still have these trophies up in my bedroom to this day, and I, I actually hate myself for it too. And which ultimately led to, how could he have CF? You know, if you're doing all of these different things, I thought to myself, there's no way I can have CF. I'm beating that odds. That doctor is wrong. That all started to change a good bit at the end of high school. So like most kids who told they're smart, they want to be physicians. So I went to a summer camp at Brown where I actually shadowed doctors and I decided it's a hard pass. I have no intention of ever being an MD. And, and but I remember like working with these med students at Brown, I got copies of their personal statements. And their personal statements often talked about some encounter with a disease, some encounter with a family member that was medically rooted. And I thought to myself, like, oh yeah, I, I do have CF. I probably can talk about it here. So I thought to myself, okay, this will be the first time that I can use CF with the hopes of getting into a good school. And what I did was I told myself in this essay, which I went back and read, and it's pretty sad knowing who I am today, but I made it seem like, hey, guess what? I have CF, but here are all the reasons that I don't. <laughs> By once again separating myself from the identity of CF through all these different awards and whatnot, but it was my first time kind of opening up. So my high school had 52 people in my graduating class. And of those 52 people, I was very close with some, and obviously, as you got for way, further away, some of these people I wasn't so close with. So I thought to myself, well, why don't I have these people that are more like secondary or like tertiary friends, like, why don't I have them read my personal statement? Because I was too embarrassed to have my inner circle close friends know that I had CF. So those were the first people to ever know that I had CF. And once again, I wasn't even comfortable enough letting my inner circle people in. But to give a little context to this story, and the reason it's a little difficult, I was also coming out as gay at the same time, and frankly, that could be a whole conference in and of itself. And, but keep in mind, how do you tell best friend, hey, I have a terminal illness, hey, I'm also gay? And so I found myself with two groupings of friends, those who were like in on one, those who were in on the other, and it became, frankly, a complete cluster in my life for a while. Because how do you drop these two nuclear bombs on people when they had no idea the entire time? And those who might be more familiar, like you could probably take a lot of this talk so far and replace CF with the word gay, and it would probably still fit, this idea of covering up who you are and presenting who you aren't just because you're embarrassed to come out. So ultimately, after writing these personal statements, it paid off. I got into colleges. Um, I ended up choosing to go to Duke University because it was the recession and I got a lot of money. And I felt on top of the world. Like, remember, I'm from this island sandbar in South Carolina. Like, I did all these things. I was going to a good school. And I think, remember thinking to myself, like, yeah, like, I did international science and engineering fair, so I probably should be an engineer because when I was in high school, I was that kid. I took AP physics. I was going to be a physicist. I took AP chemistry. I was going to be a chemist. I took AP biology. I was going to be a biologist. So I thought to myself, well, why don't I just combine it? And biomedical engineering turned out to be the best combination of all of them. But I remember thinking, look, CF didn't define me. CF couldn't define me. How could I have CF? Because look at what I had done. 
I had separated myself so much at this point, even though I had started to let people in, that I kind of had, was lying to myself about what it was like to have CF. When keep in mind, I still was a person with CF. I still was coughing a lot. I still was on antibiotics. I still was going through all these different torments in hell. Sure, I was struggling with insurance back then, which that's another conference in itself. And it's just hard to fathom that all these things were happening behind the scenes. And I developed a great sense of independence because I remember taking a lot of these responsibilities from my parents and taking control of them myself. But then college came around, so college is kind of a giant party at times. But it was a really hard time balancing everything for me. Because if you remember, I was so good at compartmentalizing what it meant to have CF, but now when I was at Duke, my CF clinic was a seven minute walk from my dorm room. So how do you space yourself out from CF when it's a seven minute walk from where your bed is? So that was the first time that I really had to come to terms that CF is very prevalent in my life. But also just balancing health in college is hard, you know? Dorms are gross. I actually um, had a few issues because um, hypertonic saline makes a really ne like fun nebulous cloud. And um, I would set off the smoke detector every time I did it. Um, so the fire department would always show up. So I remember having to work with housing and explain to them like, hey, I can't do my treatments. And it was a nightmare doing that. But every time I would do my treatments in the dorm room, the fire department would show up, even with the window open, even with the Tupperware thing over top of the smoke detector. Um, it just, it was hard. But then the other thing as well is you have to tell your professors when you're going to a CF appointment. You know, CF clinics don't run from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. They run in the middle of the day. So I remember telling my professors, like, hey, I'm going to this CF appointment. But this is where it started to get hard, too. Not all professors that I ran into in college were actually that nice. Um, I remember one professor, so this was after a bad CF appointment where I, all CF appointments are kind of scary, but this one, like, my lung function had gone down. I wasn't happy. I walk into this professor's office afterward, and she told me, quote, learn to leave your shit at the door before walking into my office. A second one told me after, once again, so CF appointments just generally make me anxious. Like, you can ask anyone in my family, like, I'm a nightmare before them. And another professor told me, he's like, I think you need counseling. I'm worried you're going to hurt yourself. Really overstepping the boundary. And college was the first time that I really had this experience where I was letting people in and kind of getting that negative backlash. Um, and then generally in college, balancing a social life on top of it and dating is also rather hard because when you have CF, it, you gotta be like, hey friends, I don't wanna go to that foam party. That's probably not the best idea either. Um, but in general, pressure brings out your CF. Um, college was one of the first times that I was academically challenged beyond compare. I was balancing all these different things. You're finding your identity as an adult, your independence. And for me, anytime life got hard, CF was always right there. So anytime I had like a complete cathartic breakdown with friends, CF was always in that conversation. But my family was a six hour drive away or a non-direct flight to Durham, North Carolina. So my friends in college became my family. So that was the first time that I really had ever let external people in. They had known the whole identity of Reed and it really started to kind of come to terms with who I was as a person, you know? Developing my own self of self-advocacy, looking out for myself when I'm telling professors who aren't, aren't being very nice, and also just having to schedule my own appointments and whatnot, you learn how to develop your own sense of advocacy. So if we remember, I really liked science and research back in high school. So I went to college and I remember telling myself like, okay, it's time to engage in research, so I started my freshman year, and I actually never went home for a summer. I always did research on campus because I loved it, you know? And I really do think a lot of this was this idea of having CF and taking problems and delivering on them, you know? And it was my first time really thinking um, scientifically about CF. You know, I was developing all these different skills. I was reading papers. Sure, the lab I worked in in undergrad was orthopedics, but I really chose this lab because it was a great opportunity to get hands-on involvement in science. And I think a lot of people in science will agree that the skills you pick up in a laboratory are rather ubiquitous for research. So it didn't exactly matter that I wasn't doing CF research because I could always read the CF research on the sides. And at the end of college, I kind of had this second coming out with CF, you know? I had learned that 
possibly there was an extent that presenting my CF identity through a scientific lens was another way of buffering yourself because scientific papers don't always cover the identity of the person with CF. For example, pick up a CF paper, CF is a terminal illness, CF is a life shortening illness, CF is a chronic illness. It really kind of separates the human identity from the actual scientific research in the first statement or a sentence. So you can break yourself away from what was being discussed there and kind of present yourself like, hey, I have CF, but let me talk to you about the science because the science you can parse out from who you are as a person. But ultimately, I wanted to get more involved with CF. And when you get involved with CF as an advocate, you can't really hide the fact that you have CF. So for example, I became involved with the CF Foundation. I became a director for USACFA, the publishers of CF Roundtable, except these things go online. In order to be a director for USACFA, you need to have CF. So you can't really hide it anymore because of Google.com. But with that came a commitment to be open. You know, if things are going to be online, like I can't hide these things anymore. So I had my second coming out with these people from high school. So if you remember from high school, I like talked to them about my CF, maybe my secondary friends, my college friends were all in the know. But until I was about 22 years old, my best friends from high school still did not know I had CF. I completely hid it from them. Every sickness, any time I had to go to the hospital, they had no idea. And it's something that I still regret to this day, but I actually lost a really good friend of mine because she, I remember her telling me, how could we be so close? How could I consider you a brother? How could we come out as gay together, but you won't tell me, you didn't tell me you had CF? And that's hard. Especially, I, these conversations all came with extreme tears because these people felt like I had been lying to them. How could I not tell them? How could I have these relationships with them? And with that came a greater commitment to be open. And so at this point, I decided I wanted to pursue a PhD, so I was going to grad school. And instead of taking my high school approach of saying, I have CF, but no, I don't, I said, I have CF. This is why it's hard. These are the challenges, and these are why the challenges make me a better scientist. But with this whole process of once again coming out again with CF professionally and in grad school, it came with a number of things, like I said, losing friendships. You know, that's really hard. Or when you're telling these friends and they're so upset with you, they're crying, they're like, how could you not be open with us? It's difficult. Being looked at differently was always something that I struggled with because what if someone looks back on a, a specific situation and then now, understands it because I have CF, or they look at it differently because I have CF. Being made fun of, which I know sounds childish, but it's hard, and something that I still go through to this day, there have been a number of times that I've boarded flights with a mask on, as CF people do, that I've had people say mean things to me. Like one guy, when I was pre-boarding, like slammed his arm into me and said, people with disabilities only. Um, I've had people say, are you wearing the mask for attention? So. You ha and then, of course, like being made fun of. I once had a flight attendant who said you should probably get a smaller CPAP when it's one of those like vest machines. Um, so you get made fun of a good bit, and you also get a lot of um, round trip free tickets from American Airlines. <laughs> and then, lastly, being taken advantage of. So when I was interviewing for grad school, I actually had more than one lab that had told me that you'd be a great asset to our laboratory because you're an infinite source of mutated cells. <laughs> and, which I guess I can laugh about, but at the same time, I'm like, you know what, I want to be in this lab, or I want you to accept me because of my scientific ability. Please don't accept me because I have mutated cells. And that's the example of being taken advantage of. It's like, how, am I, how do you want me to react to it? Because, okay, in science, we sometimes don't know how to make jokes that land. And I just didn't know what the actual intent of this was. <laughs> But ultimately, through all this vulnerability, you kind of have to realize, like, you have to strengthen yourself through all of this. So through, at the end of this whole, like, vulnerable process of these bad things, I thought to myself, well, you know, CF does have its benefits. You know, like, some of the skills of CF include complex, effective communication. You know, talking to someone who doesn't know CF, talking to a physician, talking to a scientist, talking to a friend. Different levels of CF understanding require different levels of communication. Negotiation, insurance companies, um, 
requires a lot of negotiation and time, and just learning how to effectively get the things you need. Literature, learning how to go through the internet and be able to tell this is probably not the most reliable source for CF, this is a reliable source. Understanding the scientific and medical jargon, Ivacaptor, Lumacaptor, Bronchiectasis, you learn all these different terms that a lot of people don't usually have in their vernacular. Time management. People with CF put hours into their day and we still get stuff done and we still have full-time jobs. And keep in mind, people often think of like CF as like, oh, you do your treatments and whatnot, but exercise is often on top of that as well. So there are some things that people don't even realize they're included in a CF regimen that are mandated as well by a doctor. Preparation. So preparing for travel requires a little extra energy when you have CF. Preparing for, example, a natural disaster, or for example, I usually have a bag ready just in case there's an emergency and I need to get home because my home is 12 hours away. And I don't really have the time to prepare everything. Lastly, multitasking. People with CF usually don't have reminders on their phone to tell them what drug to take at what given point. You just have it all in your head. And with all of that, I read this list, I'm like, well, what company wouldn't want to hire us? These are pretty much great skills to have, and these really do carry out throughout people's career. So after I was going through the whole interview process and kind of realized, like, you know, CF does make me a better candidate for research or just for my career, I chose to go to Vanderbilt University to pursue my PhD in biomedical engineering. Within my first year there, I received a fellowship um, through the National Science Foundation called the uh, National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. It paid for my entire graduate program and it even paid me to go, so I was very proud of that. But it was interesting learning how to develop professionalism within a lab, you know? You have a desk that is usually in a bay, so this is a bit of a dark picture, but you have no privacy. So if you need to pick up the phone and talk to a doctor, if you need to talk to your insurance company, your family, if you're coughing a lot, particularly on that day, there's really not a lot of privacy. So learning how to kind of stand up for yourself and kind of look out for yourself, even when you're technically in public. But then there are other challenges that have come with grad school as well, at least in my experience. One, my lab focuses on lungs, so pulmonary lab. So we would often get transplants. Sure, they weren't often CF lungs, but you best bet that I was nowhere in that building if we ever had a human lung come up to our lab, just because you don't want to catch the bugs that could potentially be in that lung. Incubators, I have a hard time with incubators to this day. A lot of my research involves something called in vitro, which was cell culture, so I'd actually have to put cells that were in a flask into an incubator, and in parts of my research, I would actually make different platforms and actually hook up different circuits within an incubator. So I would always wear a mask when going into one, because I don't know what is culturing that, because you don't often know if people are practicing the right techniques before putting cells within an incubator, and you don't want to get sick. And with those incubators, I often added an extra treatment, just if I was in an incubator a lot that day, so doing an extra hypertonic saline just to flush out my lungs. Don't know if it actually helped, but for me, it just kind of made me feel more mentally settled. You're also in a hospital setting often in biomedical research. So learning how to navigate hospitals, how to avoid maybe patient-facing areas, how to look out for yourself just to keep yourself healthy. People don't often listen is another point. There are times when I've had lab mates who would say, oh, Reed, why are you in at 11 a.m.? Are you hungover? I'll be like, no, actually, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> like, you know, I'd say if I talked about it yesterday. And you have to constantly remind people because this is another conference in itself, but CF is an invisible illness. So you sometimes have to remind people, no, I have CF and this is what it's like. And then this is a good example that happened to me two months ago. I call it my anemia story. So people probably know that getting a PhD is pretty rigorous. It's really hard. It takes a lot out of you. So I was finishing up my PhD. I just done my first draft of my dissertation and I was feeling awful. I, my heart rate was up. I had awful headaches. I would get a little bit out of breath after climbing a few stories. And I remember thinking to myself, God, this is what a PhD is like. This is what it's like to get one. This, this stress is really getting to me. I now get what stress is like. And fortunately, my lab has a few people with MDs. And I remember looking at one of my mentors, and he's like, you need to go to student health right now. He's like, you are white. Like, you, your lips have no color whatsoever. And I remember thinking, oh, no, Josh, like, I'm completely fine. I'm just really stressed. Like, I'm not getting enough sleep. And I go to student health. They give me an IV. They do CBCs. They check my blood. And they get a call back. It's like, you're hematocrit 17%. Um, 
So in grad school, what sickness versus what is stress of getting a PhD is also something that comes with a great level of learning. And this is probably something that can be applied to people's jobs in general. This isn't really just a graduate level thing. But learning how to understand what your body is doing versus what is stress at work. But through all of this, I found myself becoming a scientist with CF. You know, so while in grad school, I was under different changes in political structure. Science was having changes in it, insurance was having changes in it. And I remember thinking to myself, huh, I now have this scientific background. What can I do about it? How can I present who I am through an advocacy lens? And this is when I started to get more involved in the state of Tennessee. This is when I started to get more involved at the federal level. These are actually chocolates I got from Barack Obama. I like have them on display to this day. <laughs> and um, just learning how to be a scientist with CF, because you can really wear two lenses here. One, I can talk to you about science and what it's like to have the disease through all of the data, but also step back and be like, hey, no, but really, this, this really sucks. And we have people who struggle, and like I struggle a lot, so like, let's back away from the data. And remember, this is something that Sue Landgraf was great at in DC. She used to bring pictures because sometimes pictures will speak more than data, oftentimes in DC. And just learning how to juggle the two made me a better advocate as someone with CF and someone who is also a patient with CF, not just a scientist. So this is something I wanted to throw in here while we're talking about mean things professors had said to me, have said to me. Um, so I was in a laboratory working on an experiment, and the experiment really wasn't going well, to be completely frank. But there were a lot of things going on in that lab that I wasn't comfortable with. And I wanted to separate myself from it. And I told the professor, hey, like, eh, this is really isn't working. After some very colorful language and mean things said to me, he also said this. We accepted you because we felt bad for you. Um, people with CF are very strong, but we also do have Achilles heels. And this made me almost drop out of grad school. It's hard to have CF enough, but then when someone tells you that you are a pity acceptance because we felt bad for you, because we didn't think you would make it out alive, hurts. And this is something that I know other people with CF have also experienced within their own careers, but this is something that for me really almost made me drop it all. You know, when people take advantage of your CF because you're in a bad place, when people don't know how to understand their own situations, they look for any excuse possible. But Ultimately, you know, CF did make me a better scientist and a better advocate, you know? You do take all these different pills, you're balancing all these different things in your head, you have your treatment regimens, you're balancing insurance, you're balancing um, your doctor's appointments as well, and you would easily translate that skill set into your career, into advocacy, into your science as well, but you're also the patient, you know? You're also someone with CF who can say, hey, like, you really should listen to this, or you don't know what it's like to have CF. I remember like when I've been on the Hill before, be like, people will make all these statements like, oh, well, healthcare is expensive. Like, do you know what CF is? No. <laughs> they have no idea what CF is. And just being able to step back and be like, well, here's what CF is through my perspective, and here's what CF is through the science, and why you should care about it. And also the time management is great as well. So having CF also maybe a better advocate in terms of time management, because sometimes you have to do things quickly when there are changes that are gonna have incredible impacts on the CF community. So ultimately two weeks ago, I got my PhD and I'm done with grad school. And it's been quite a journey. So I actually put like thank you to my committee. So I think being open about my CF and my struggles with my committee has been one of the most beneficial things and something that I hope people in the CF community can have mentors who look out for you, especially when you're like, hey, like, I'm in the hospital right now. Whereas before I never would have said a thing, but having these people know, but you also have to look out for yourself a bit, be like, hey, like, I'm sorry, I know I have this committee meeting coming up, but my insurance is about to not give me my medications, I'm gonna run out. Also, learning how to address microaggressions from your committee is hard. So committees, for people who don't know, you're, usually when you're getting a PhD, you have five people who eventually grant you your PhD when you are you kind of hit what they think is necessary for you to get your degree. And they're kind of difficult sometimes, and sometimes they just make up reasons for why you need to do more if you don't present something right. They're very critical people. And I remember I had someone on my committee who said, well, I know you have CF, so this is okay. 
But, and of course, I'm like, here we go again. And now that I know this professor, I don't forgive him for saying that, or I, he shouldn't have said that, but I know he does the same thing to other people as well. But it's like people with CF are also more vulnerable possibly, at least me, because I dealt with so much compartmentalizing and denial of my CF, so when people bring it up as a weakness, I struggle with it. And so hearing those microaggressions where saying that you did a mediocre job because you have CF and therefore you are okay, or I will forgive it, is hard to do. And it's hard to come back from. But ultimately, thank you CF for my career. You know, if I had, I, I don't know exactly what um, road I would have taken. Perhaps if I didn't have CF, I would have become a mechanical engineer or an aerospace engineer, something a bit more boring. Because CF kind of gave me that idea of science and medicine. So I really think that having CF kind of put me down the path of more of a biomedical route, but also just the advocacy and the power that comes with understanding science, but also understanding what it's like to have the disease gets you involved. Companies will reach out and ask you questions. You'll have opportunities to talk to people who are lawmakers as well. And it's great. And um, as introduced, like so, I just took a fellowship opportunity at the FDA, and I'll be moving out there October 1st, so I'm really excited. And you best bet I did play my CF card there. <laughs> and I said to him, hey, the number of things that have come through those buildings that I now take that have helped me or have caught on fire in my apartment, this will be cool. <laughs> and then here's me being a professional scientist. <laughs> Yeah, okay, we're almost done here. So lastly, I just want to talk about, so in science, we often define things as CF is this disease, CFTR, we define things by numbers. But being a patient or being someone with CF allows you to define things through the human experience. Like what it's like to have CF in terms of what's it like to sometimes know that you might not have as much time as someone else? What's it like to balance your health care and your health? It's difficult to explain that to other people. What's it like to have relationships in CF? Be it with family, be it with friends, be it with partners. What's it like to find jobs when you have CF? What's it like to find pleasure and go on vacations when you CF? There are so many more things that go into what it's like to have CF that we can often understand in science. And that's why it's important to also get people involved in their own disease, possibly even outside of CF. And it's something that I'm excited that is currently happening right now in the field, seeing people who for example, have Crohn's disease and now research Crohn's disease in their graduate degree. So last slide here, CF in the future. I think that at this conference, we're gonna see just how exciting the field of CF is, especially since I've been taking meds. The number of CFTR modulators alone that are now even being researched in clinical trials is astounding. But let's not forget that this is still a journey that we need to keep going. We, we still need more effort here. We need more diversity of CFTR modulators. We also need to expect that, hey, so as someone who's lived a couple or a few decades suddenly gets these magical CFTR modulators that are great, we also still have several years of biofilms and damage. So we really need to keep up other research for things like mucociliary clearance and anti-infectives because modulators may not be enough. So remember that there are other things in this pipeline as well. And with that, I'd like to open up to any questions.